It is Wednesday, September the 21st, 2022. Welcome into episode 53 of Tone of the Slab, Pitching with David Cohn. It is a production of John Boy Media, and it's pitching discussions every single week with the five-time World Series champion and the Cy Young Award winner, David Cohn, the research maven, James Smythe, and myself, Justin Shackle. This episode is brought to you by Bear Burger. And I say that we talk pitching each and every week is we get set to talk about a uh, specific hitter with a, a former pitcher who kind of sees like the brilliance of another hitter every day who also pitches. So yeah, Mark Gubazaj joining us here to talk a little Judge Otani this week. That debate is probably heating up faster and faster as Aaron Judge is getting closer to potentially tying and then passing Roger Maris for the American League single season home run record, obviously achieving Yankees history by doing that as well. But David Judge, Otani, it is topics one, two, and three throughout baseball. And it's pretty cool that this is happening in a sports landscape, guys, that is overtaken by the NFL at this point here in, in September, in mid-September. In the baseball world, it's obviously the number one topic. I think it's near the top in the overall sports landscape, and that's pretty cool. It's, it's kind of break-in time, right? Uh, when the judge comes up to hit or pull holes, it's, it's uh, break-in time. Uh, no, stop what you're doing, get to a TV, and see what happens, historically speaking. And so I thought my good buddy, Mark Gubas, I was a good guy to bring in, too, and talk about another guy who's kind of making history every time he pitches, it seems like, or hits. It's uh, Shohei Otani and the Angels. And Mark Gubas was my minor league buddy. We grew up together in the minor leagues with the Royal Systems. A great guy. He was a great pitcher, too. Underrated. Uh, he was a monster on the mound and had some shoulder issues that kind of derailed his career a little bit along the way. But um, he, we talk about that. Uh, we talk about our personal relationship. And he knows Shohei Otani as well as anybody covering the Angels. So, he gives us some great in insight on Shohei Otani. It marks the color analyst for Angel TV broadcast on, on Bally Sports West. Obviously, a long history with you, David. And you mentioned, you know, the 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 bulldog mentality that Mark Ubaza had as a player on the mound. There was a three-year period in the late 80s where Gubaza was pitching. 240 innings, 200, you know, 268 innings. I don't have the number, exact numbers in front of me. Oh, basically at or around or above 250 innings, three consecutive seasons. Obviously that would be unheard of in this day and age. It's wild. Um, but he, he gives terrific insight on what Shohei Otani is all about. And I mean, it's obviously on the surface, like LA, New York, East coast, West coast. Um, you have your faction of, Angel fans that believe Shohei Otani, no matter what anyone else can really do, is the superior talent in all of baseball. And in a way, it is true. But, uh, but as we begin this episode, we started off with the opener. There is reason to obviously listen and potentially sway the opinions if you are watching Aaron Judge every day, such as yourself, James, and myself. Well, yeah, I mean, it's what he's doing is, is as good as any season we've ever seen. I mean, you should watch what's happening, savor it, because we may never see another season like this uh, that Judge that Aaron Judge is having. It, it is that good and that meaningful, too. I mean, the Yankees in the month of August almost face planted collectively, and Aaron Judge was there. He's like the one guy that reached down and grabbed them out of, out of the water to keep them from drowning. I mean, that's how important. Aaron Judge has been to this team, and there's not another MVP candidate on the Yankees. It's Aaron Judge. You look at uh, Houston, they have three great players, Altuve and Bregman and, and Alvarez. And you look at the Los Angeles Dodgers, they have three great players for the top of the order that are going to probably all get MVP consideration. Aaron Judge doesn't have that. He hasn't had that all year long. It's Aaron Judge and, and Aaron Judge. That's it. And he has single-handedly almost saved the Yankee season, especially in the month of August. James, I know you are as big of a Shohei Otani fan as they come in, in the sport of baseball, and we all are. But I think we need to be keeping score here at this point, week in and week out. Where are you on the MVP debate between Otani and Judge? I think it's Judge, and I, I don't think it's, as, it's even that close, even though Otani is even better than he was last year, and he's having 
an incredible season. He has surpassed any expectations that we could have had for him starting his big league career. He's actually doing it. That said, while Otani's season might be MVP 19 out of 20 years or 49 out of 50 or whatever you want to call it, what Judge is doing this year is his, so historic. It's And the stretches that he's been on have really only been done by Babe Ruth and, and peak Barry Bonds in the early 2000s. The, the stretches of his batting average, on base, slug, that whole combination. And so what he's doing this year is MVP. And it's just, I guess it's just a shame that they're, that somebody's going to not win it considering the caliber of the seasons that we're having that just happen to be in the same league in the same year. So we're going to talk more Judge Otani with Mark coming up in a little bit. We'll talk a little Verlander Scherzer as well as both made their returns to their respective teams over the last week. Catch up on the AL Cy Young Award race here and we'll Let's do that right here, right out of the gate with, with the American League Cy Young Award. Mentioned Verlander returning back on Friday uh, following a calf injury. It sidelined him roughly three weeks for the Astros, and he returns to pitch five no-hit innings and strikes out nine. Uh, it came against the A's, and it came at a right time for Verlander's supporters for the Cy Young Award because guys, for a while in the summer, um, even early portions of August before he went down, people felt like it was a lock that Justin Verlander was on his way to winning a Cy Young Award. And I really have come to appreciate certain stats since doing this podcast with you guys. Um, one of the stats that I've traditionally liked is WHIP. Um, I know you guys are, are big on ERA Plus, uh, FIP, but also David like to just – make it as basic as possible. Like innings pitch matters. Um, the, the total innings matters. How many times you take the ball and are able to post for your team that should enter the equation here as well. So um, there are other guys who have had really impressive seasons who may have more innings and that ERA for Verlander or Dylan seats, you know, they're pretty shiny. They're among the league leaders in the American league. Obviously Verlander is well ahead there, but they, um, they may lack in the innings and some other guys may have more innings vice versa may have a slightly higher ERA overall, though some guys aren't just uh, being talked about at the moment. So for the AL Cy Young award, I'm wondering for both of you, would you take Verlander cease or the field when it comes to the winner? The, the field now includes Otani, who's making a big run. I think that's a story with Shohei Otani is what he's doing on the mound. Uh, if you look at his offensive numbers, they're, they're outstanding, but they're not as good as they were last year. Last year, he had 49 home runs, Otani. So when you just look at his offensive numbers, I think baseball reference rank, ranks his offensive war at, in the mid threes or not even quite to four yet. Judge is almost at 10. So just to give you an idea, offensively, how they compare just their offensive numbers, uh, Otani, a DH, obviously, um, judge playing center field factors into the overall war ranking. But with all that being said, Otani on the mound is making a big run. He shows no signs of slowing down. He's better than he's ever been. I think he can run the table the rest of the way in terms of pitching, that he might sneak in there and, uh, and, and maybe at least get to two, to number two, right behind Verlander. It's still Verlander's to lose. The quality of his numbers are simply too good, even with the time missed. He still has some starts left to, to continue on that run and kind of pad his stats. So, yeah, you know, to answer your question in a long-winded way, I'm still taking Verlander and Cease over the field. But Otani is, a, is somebody to watch because of his pitching this year. That's the difference with Otani is on the mound. I think it's Verlander. He only missed a couple of weeks. So he's up. he still has 25 starts. I, I Looking at the ERA leaderboard and the innings count, I see where you're going, Shaq, because you have Verlander and, Mc, and McClanahan and Cease. They're in that high 150s, 160s range in innings, and there's your top three in ERA. Then you have Alec Manoa and Framber Valdez also in the top six, and they're already over 180 innings. But I do think that Verlander is close enough in innings. He'll end up being somewhere within 20 or, or so, 25 innings, of those, of those innings leaders. And I think that that's close enough 
to make up for the gap in ERA where Verlander's ERA right now is 1.78. I think that carries the day. In, in pedigree too. Uh, believe me, a lot of the writers yeah. look at pedigree and whether it's supposed to be a single season award, there's a lot of veteran writers that factor in legacy as well. And the fact that he's doing this at his age, that it's almost like extra credit, whether you believe in that or not, it's real. And it, it, it's something that the writers believe in, especially the veteran writers. Award season narrative always comes into play and Verlander coming back from Tommy John at his age for a, for an Astros team that's going to win the league, the regular season title in the American league, that, that really says something too. That's a great point. Uh, we, we love our stories. So him coming back from Tommy John surgery, pulling this off probably will carry a lot of weight in the minds of a lot of voters. I think, uh, I think it's fair to say though, we're at a stage where we may, may not have to spend so much time on it, but this may be worth revisiting week after week here, just to, keep tabs on based on whether or not one pitcher has a, a bum outing, so to speak over the final turn. But yeah, that raise uh, it's super sparkly right now for, for Justin Verlander. It's really tough. The overall uh, dominance that he's had when he's been out there, like you said, James, 25 starts already. Um, it's interesting though, to, to play up the drama is you obviously want to be able to do that. The angels with Otani, David, they play Texas, Minnesota and Oakland the rest of the way. So well, let me put it to you this way. If you guys had to bet every penny you had on one start right now on the mound, who's throwing the ball the best right now? Your bank accounts on the line, everything you own. You got to face an awesome offensive team, pick a team, the Dodgers, the Astros, who do you want on the mound to face the best offensive team right now, right now, well, the way they're throwing the ball as we speak. You want to know what, maybe, maybe the, the this could be, a cop-out answer, but I'm going to go with Verlander over Otani. Well, um, that's that, that is a legitimate question. Uh, yeah. Verlander's that good, but I, I might take Otani right now, just the way he's throwing the ball right now, his improvements that he's made, but you're right. I mean, that, that's, uh, this, it probably is not relevant for the Cy Young award purposes, but just to, you know, as a interesting question on the side, I mean, who's, who's throwing the ball the best right now? Mm -hmm. It might be Otani. We may be going on a tangent here, but there, there's there's a criteria that I can't get out of my head when it comes to the the award debates. And I know a lot of people feel like, well, why does specifically with the MVP award? But, um, you know, why should the team's uh, overall success matter here? Well, <laughs> Joey Otani, since he's been in the U.S., like how many meaningful games has he played in the month of September? I think that means something. You can't just say, and, and as far as the MVP award debate goes, you can't just say, well, if you take away Judge from the Yankees and you put Otani in his place, the Yankees have the same level of success. If you take away Otani from you know the Angels and replace him with Judge, the Angels are where going to be where they're at. Like, yes, we may think, and and I would put, uh, you know, I would bet some money that he would perform fine in high pressure situations. We really don't know. Like we we really do not know. Obvi again, I would I would bet the house that he would be okay, but we've never seen him play in a meaningful game down the stretch. I can't get that out of my mind. I don't know why. I just can't. Valid, it's a valid point, James. I'll, I'll have you weigh in here, but you're right. And you know what Verlander can do. He's done it many mm -hmm. times on the big stage. So it's a valid point, Jack. Right, and, and as far as MVP goes, you know I. I'm on the record on here talking about, you know, we shouldn't hold it against the player if they're if they're on a bad team. You know, both MVPs uh, last year did not make the postseason with Otani and Bryce Harper with the Phillies. At the same time, though, I see where you're coming from, Shaq, because it might not necessarily be about holding a a, a bad team against a player rather than giving someone like Judge extra credit for having the season he is in a pennant race and for a winning team that's going to the postseason. Yeah. The, the, the angels have, unfortunately, we all want to see him do well because they have the arguably the two best players in the sport. They've really played for nothing down the stretch since Otani has been here. So we, we can't know how he'd react with the stakes that high. 
Um, one, one more quick story. And I, know, I know we're going on a tangent here. One more quick yeah. story. I was in San Francisco for Sunday Night Baseball, had a long talk with Gabe Kapler, one of the most progressive thinkers in the game, very much pro-analytics. Asked him about Wilmer, Wilmer Flores and the extension that the Giants just signed him to. And Gabe Kapler used the word clutch hitter. And Gabe's, Gabe, he almost choked on it because he said, if you asked me that five <laughs> years ago, I would say analytics doesn't believe in clutch, right? They believe in if you're a good hitter, you're a good hitter. The numbers, sample sizes, uh, you know, matter. And, you know, if you're a good hitter, it'll bear out over the long run. But he has come full circle in, in terms of saying, you know what, there is something to it. And that goes right to the heart of what you're saying, Shaq, about that, you know, Verlander's clutch. It's proven that he's clutch. You know you can trust him. That's that's so we're kind of where the rubber meets the road, right? And you know me, I'm pro analytics. I love more information, but there is something about emotional, your emotional IQ on the mound, how you feel, how you react in certain situations. It, it matters. And I was shocked to hear Gabe Kapler kind of come full, full circle. Gabe Kapler, the manager of the Giants, of all people, who built the Dodgers, who helped build their system uh, in terms of uh, the minor league uh, the program and the analytics-driven departments that they have. So... Yeah, it's, it's it's an interesting topic. It really is. Coming on the heels of Joe Madden, what we talked about last week with Joe Madden and his right. comments about analytics in the clubhouse. So I don't mean to go off on a tangent, but I thought you guys would be interested in what Gabe Kapler had to say about clutch. Definitely. You, you know, J- Justin Verlander is also kind of like in a in a race with, with Max Scherzer. That's not going to be ending this season. They're going to keep going here. But uh, Max Scherzer tossed six perfect innings with nine strikeouts in his return for the Mets on Monday. And in the process, he picks up his 200th career victory. The Mets clinch a postseason spot as well. And he moved past Verlander for 13th place on the all-time strikeout list. Now, Verlander has, at this moment, eight fewer than Scherzer. So you can... You know, you can bet that when Verlander makes his next start, he could probably pass Scherzer again. Uh, Verlander's 39, Scherzer's 38. Which pitcher finishes his respective career with more strikeouts? You know, I I had a chance to interview Justin Verlander earlier this year uh, before Sunday Night Baseball, and he has extremely high goals. He wants to be part of the 4,000 strikeout club. He wants to be Tom Brady-like. He's got a new new elbow, as they say. You know, he's been through Tommy John. He, he understands how to train better than ever nowadays. He understands his body. It seems to be a big deal. Mark Gubaza mentioned that with Shohei Otani. People have talked about Aaron Judge learning how to take care of his body this year better and his program after games and the right amount of workload, the right amount of maintenance. So that's a big deal. Justin Verlander's on top of that. That's going to be interesting to see. You know, Verlander's not going away anytime soon. So they're going to go back and forth, and 4,000 strikeouts is the goal for Justin Verlander. So you know, it's, it, we can talk about tit for tat right now as they're over 3,000, which is a huge number. Yeah, this is going to go on for a while. I'll go with Scherzer. He's got a little bit of the edge and age, and uh, I feel like if I don't pick him, he'll track me down and, <laughs> and come, get, come get us. But – What's cool about this is this is reminding, uh, this is before my time, but this is reminding me of Nolan Ryan and Steve Carlton. Nolan Ryan broke Walter Johnson's career strikeout record, and then Steve Carlton passed that mark too. And then for a while, Carlton and Ryan were going like this, start after start after start. Ryan would make a start, and he'd get up here, and then Carlton would pass him, and they'd trade places. So this is similar to that, not with for the all-time record, but you're having two future Hall of Famers going back and forth with each start. Hey, James, to your note uh, about Max Scherzer and, you know, Mad Max and all that stuff. He was going through his perfect outing yesterday. People were, I was wondering, I'm like, all right, when, uh, when, when push comes to shove here with the high pitch count and Buck and having to take him out, like, how is he going to react here? And he was great. Uh, you know, he high five and teammates in the dugout. Didn't seem like he was angry at all. Obviously he was returning uh, after missing a start or two, a turn or two. And uh, he, he took it well. I thought we were going to see a little, even, even despite all those circumstances, I thought we were going to still see some uh, fiery max, but we did not. And the Mets uh, go on to win. They go on to clinch a playoff berth. More tone. The slab is coming up, but now a word from our sponsor, better help more athletes are, are speaking out about the importance of their mental health, but you do not have to be a pro athlete to want to be at the top of your game. Everyone needs to take care of their mental well-being, whether you're an athlete or not in therapy, 
is the best way to stay in peak mental shape. So if you're thinking about giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option. It's convenient, it's accessible, affordable, and it's entirely online. You can get matched with a therapist after filling out a brief survey. And if you're not happy with your initial therapist, you can switch any time you want. So when you're ready to feel at the top of your mental health game, therapy can get you there. Visit betterhelp.com slash slab today to get 10% off your first month. That's better, H-E-L-P, betterhelp.com slash slab, S-L-A-B, to get 10% off your first month. Yankees pitcher, Frankie Montas, he underwent an MRI for more right shoulder issues. And the New York Post reported that he is not going to miss much time. The MRI didn't show anything significant, but the results for Montas, they have not showed up since he's been traded to New York. He's one and three, has a 6.35 ERA and eight starts since the trade. The shoulder has been an issue on and off all season. Can the Yankees afford to ride or die with this version of Frankie Montas? You you still have some time to figure it out and then see him throw again. But it's not just about inflammation or injury or where he is. It's about arm strength. And the first thing that goes, if you're a little bit fatigued or you're a little bit compromised, whether you're you're a candidate for the IL or not, is control. And, and he's a power guy. He needs to, to, to be able to finish his pitches. And that's what we saw uh, in his last start. He couldn't finish that splitter. He left a lot of splitters up. And that's such a power pitch. It's a, it's a pitch that he throws 90 miles an hour sometimes or even a little bit harder that really requires a lot of arm strength and a lot of finish at the end. So until he can do that, uh, it, it's, that's a question. That's a big question for me. So I'm not sure that you can count on Frankie Montas. Right now, he's probably number five as your starters right now, maybe four. You're, you're evaluating every start now down the stretch. You know you've got Garrett Cole. You know you've got Nestor Cortez makes Luis Severino's return all the more important because you really need him now right there in that three hole. Your number four starter, Tyone or Montas right now, and that remains to be seen. Right now, it's it's, it's Jamison Tyone, number four. Luis Severino is such an X factor down the stretch here. We're going to start to find out on Wednesday when Seve makes his first big league start in, in over two months when he takes on the Pirates. He'll have maybe three starts, four starts down the down the stretch here before the postseason. And if he's healthy and looking good, he's going to slot in as, as your game two or game three starter. And another guy that could be in the mix who has done very well in the Yankee rotation that we might see in that other spot, Domingo Herman. Yep. Herman kind of flip-flops from the rotation, momentarily going to the bullpen for a hot minute, now being forced to kind of return to the rotation with uh, with Montas seemingly going out. Again, the, the report is that he's not going to miss a start, but we have yet to hear official word from the Yankees on that. Okay, let's get to our chat with Mark Gubiza, two-time All-Star, World Series champion with the Royals, a, a Royals Hall of Famer, and an Angels broadcaster, the Angels color analyst on Valley Sports West. He sees Shohei Otani each and every day, just like David Cohn sees Aaron Judge every day as Yankees broadcasters. So yeah, we have two great friends, two former pitchers, and two broadcasters for the respective teams, which feature the MVP favorites in the American League. Our guest this week on Toe in the Slab Pitching with David Cohn is Angels broadcaster Mark Kubuza. All right, Mark is with us this week. And uh, Mark, right off the bat, if you had a vote for AL MVP this year, who are you giving it to? Oh, you want, want me to keep my job here with the Angels? Nah, <laughs> nah you know, I, <laughs> I, I look at the numbers and, and I, you know, this I go back to the last series when the Yankees were in Anaheim. Uh, Judge hits a home run, wins that game. Otani hits home runs on the other two games and the Angels win. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm seeing with his numbers on the mound this year, I mean, uh, Coney, you dominate on the mound quite a bit. He's as good as any pitcher in baseball right now. And he's putting up these numbers still offensively with 34 home runs. He's just under 90 RBIs, the triples, and his batting average is better this year. Uh, but, I mean, but Judge, I'm looking, wow, he's got a chance at a triple crown. And he's got, what, 90-some walks, his on-base percentage. All those things are pretty incredible. He's leading the Yankees. I mean, what, with all the injuries they've had, it's a really, really tough call. But, uh, but seeing Shohei every day – 
I'm just in shock at what he does on the mound. And then still, I, I know as a pitcher, after I pitch, I could barely walk. He's dealing with the 98 mile an hour fastball the next day, and, and, he's, and he's crushing the baseball. I think he's the best player maybe we've ever seen it for a, for a period of time over two years. But it's tough to go against Judge right now. Uh, <laughs> it's a really tough call. It really yeah. is a tough call. I'll tell you what, I, I, I want to say Judge because of the numbers and because they're winning. But I also want to say Otani because he's doing stuff that no one's ever done. I mean, they always compare him to Babe Ruth, but his numbers are way better than Babe Ruth, what he did at that point. So Otani, he's the best player in the world. I'll keep it at that. I think he's the best player I've ever and I, You know, we, you know, Coney, we know we play with George Brett, you know, Bo Jackson. Uh, this is stuff he did, but you know, I just kind of, you put those two guys together and Trouty watching him, Mike Trout play all these years. I've never seen anything like what he's doing. I think he's a better pitcher now than at any point I've ever seen him throw. And I think he's going to get better with his 100-mile-an-hour sinker. So I, I'm leaning towards Otani. But, I mean, if, but if I think if Judge continues in the stretch there in the end and, and he gets over 62 home runs, it's tough to go against that. Look, right, We should, probably should have put this out there right off the bat. Like, this is such an interesting – topic to discuss because it's really difficult to talk up one player without making it sound like you're putting down the other and we're definitely not yeah. doing that here look Shohei Otani is the best player I've ever seen like you said Mark like over these last two years he's the best player that any of us have ever seen um like Aaron Judge has been the big story this year and since MVP voting is so subjective it's really easy to interpret everything as like oh you're talking about judge that means you must not think much of Otani no complete opposite right there um I think the other topic is like the, the, the other debate here is like the spirit of the MVP criteria it's really subjective so when you mm -hmm. think about it that way guys David I'd, I'd like to know what you think about this are we at the point where look every year if, if Shohei Otani's doing half of what he's doing this year he's the most outstanding player in this sport period because he's something we've never seen before, does that warrant a change to either the award criteria or the creation of a completely different award? Valid questions all the way around. Uh, you know, Goob, Gooby and I both, you know, I cover the Yankees, Gooby covers the Angels. So obviously there's always going to be an inherent bias in there. As Gooby said, do I want to keep my job? You know, I, I, I totally get that. And we, you know, he gets to see Otani every day. I'm jealous. I'd love mm -hmm. to watch Otani every day too and cover him. I mean, he's the eighth wonder of the world in my mind. I mean, we're still, we're still processing how this guy's doing that. As Mark put it perfectly in terms of, the day after I pitched, I didn't, I didn't even want to come to the ballpark. I was sore. I, you know, jump in the pool, the hot tub, whatever I could do. I was a noodle. I could do nothing the next day after I pitched playing <laughs> every day and he wants it. So I think I still can't process how he's doing this, Mark. I mean, they, they, we're, we're watching something we've never seen before. We don't know how to put it into context. I mean, how, who is this guy? How is he doing this? So yes, he, he's a wonder without a doubt. And with all that being said, Aaron Judge is having one of the greatest offensive seasons in the history of the game. I mean, it's just remarkable that we have these two seasons going on at the same time. If Aaron Judge wasn't having that kind of historic season, Otani, Otani would be running away with the MVP award again. So it just shows you what kind of year both of them are having. And the fact that Aaron Judge is even in, is even at this point, maybe ahead in, in terms of the writers, probably the, the survey I take thinks, you know, mostly thinks that uh, probably he's ahead right now. But the fact that he's beating Otani uh, shows you what kind of year that uh, uh, Judge is having right now. Just two remarkable years. Are either of you, James, too, like are, are, are any of you like hung up on the, the wordage of the award, like how valuable a player is versus how outstanding a player is? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question because uh, you always thought a most valuable player is a guy that's going to get you to the postseason or potentially win a World Series. Uh, that being said, most valuable player is, the, is, for me, is the best player. And the one thing I want to say is the beauty of this between the conversation, I know there's a lot of stuff going on between East Coast, West Coast. It's kind of fun that we're at least we're talking about baseball. I mean, it's at the forefront of all the conversations. For me, that's the best. No longer we're talking, you know, you know the NFL season has started up, which is so cool, but 
you're all now all of a sudden we're talking about baseball and the MVP. You got the Yankees, you got the Angels, Aaron Judge, and then what we're seeing now from Shohei Otani again. I came into the season this year saying, and I, you know, obviously it, it looks out coming this in spring training. I said, I think Shohei is going to be better this year than he was last year. And everyone's like, how could that be? Because he finally figured out his body. And I think that's why he's better this year. I think he's going to be better next year. Now, how long he can do this, I don't know. But going back to your original question, I think it – I always – you know, you always want to see see a team in the postseason. You want to see the best players in the big show. And, and Aaron Judge is going to will his team into the big show. I mean, because they've had some guys injured. Uh, you know, some guys did not, not put together the years they anticipated for the Yankees. And just watching him in that last series, and even when, when the Angels were out in New York, I'm like, this guy is not human either. I mean, both these guys are just not <laughs> human beings. That's all you can describe, obviously. Cody, so two freaks, like, two freaks of nature, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, we're freaks in another different way, but uh, these are freaks of nature. This is a great way to celebrate two unique superstars doing their own thing in their own way. And this debate, I don't really get hung up on the, the valuable aspect or the team aspect. It's an individual award. And as we've seen, this isn't like football and basketball where one superstar can, can control so much of the game. You only come to bat so many times in a game. A pitcher will only take the ball so many days. As we saw with Mike Trout over the last 10 years, you could have the best player in the, in the game and not make the postseason. So I wouldn't want to, I guess, I wouldn't want to maybe heart, punish is too harsh a word, but you wouldn't want to punish Otani or Trout in past years for having struggling teammates. So I think you would just reward the best player. And in my mind, I think I would give it to Judge just because of the historic nature of the season. If he was only hitting 52 home runs instead of chasing 62, then Otani's probably the MVP. But what Judge is doing, as Coney mentioned, is, is one of the great offensive seasons we've ever seen. Yeah. I mean, and, and one thing the other day, for instance, for Shohei Otani, he's facing the, the last four starts have been against the Jays, the Astros, the Astros, and then Seattle, all four teams going into postseason. His ERA during that stretch, 0.67. I mean, he's been dominating. He went seven innings against Seattle the other day. He doubled home the first run, walked, and then eventually scored the second run, and they won two to one. So he did everything himself to win the game. But uh, – I, I, then, then as the process, we're, we're showing that the next day we're, we're, we're showing it on our broadcast because you know what? You, you want to be fair because we love the game of baseball. Aaron Judge hitting two mammoth home runs the very next day. So I'm like, <laughs> yes. this is like a heavy – these guys are like heavyweight fighters going out at the end. And I think it's really and, – and right now, Shohei Otani is scheduled to pitch the last game of the season. Now, as weird as it sounds, it might come down to the MVP voting and the way everyone's swayed one way or the other way. The last game, what if Shohei Otani last game of the season throws a perfect game? And, Coney, you know a lot about perfect games. What if he throws a perfect game the last game of the season? I mean, it's – but by that point, Judge may have 67 home runs for all we know, too. But it's it's, it's beautiful. I, I love right. the fact is – and there's some passionate people, Coney. You know that because there's a lot of passionate writers out in yeah. New York. They're going hard on everybody in, in Anaheim. They're all saying, what kind of city is Anaheim? They go, what? by the way, it's – beautiful weather every day of the year and it's, it's a great little city but uh, <laughs> yes. it, it's it's funny it's funny how it goes but that's what i love about the passion of you know the conversation with sports i mean this it, because you're going to be in one way or the other way we're all blessed to be able to see these two guys play yeah gooby i guess that's a question i have for otani as we narrow this down a little bit it seemed like last year his offense was a little better than his pitching and this year it's reversed a little bit where maybe just numbers wise his pitching's probably eclipsed his offense. Both are great, but it seems like he's taking that next step in pitching. He's going 100 mile an hour sinkers now. I mean, what do you see <laughs> different in a difference in terms of his pitching this year compared to last year? And, and Coney, also, he's thrown. I, I, I was watching a game the other day, and I'm like, wait a minute, he's thrown it like almost like he used to do, changing his arm angle on his slider now. So he's throwing a slider at 85, and the next slider from a different angle with a different horizontal break compared to a vertical break on the same exact pitch. That's six miles an hour differential in speed. Then he throwing a cutter at 93. It's, it's sinker. And he was joking with me the other day. He goes, and, he, and his interpreter, Ipe, were saying, I'm going to be a better pitcher next year because I'm going to use that pitch a little bit more. And I'm thinking, wow, can you imagine if you're working that lower part of the strike zone along with his four-seamer upstairs, it's going to make that splitter down and his other pitches down better because then he's got, you know, hitters can't distract 
lower part of the strike zone and let go of those pitches out of his own because now they got to deal with a fastball down there. So I, I think he's – we always joke around, Coney, and call him the creative one, kind of like a, a Maddox. And, and I, I even showed a, something with you the other day when your different deliveries you used to have to be able to – just to change arm angles and throw off the timing of hitters. He is so good at throwing off the timing of hitters, even though the majority of his pitches are pretty firm. Then he'll drop a 75-mile-an-hour curveball. And I actually, during broadcast, I'll just laugh. I go, it ain't right. It ain't right. <laughs> yeah. You should be able to do yeah. this stuff. Yeah. I mean, a 100-mile-an-hour yeah. fastball alone should say, hey, okay, that's all I'm going to throw. But throwing that in there, I was like, wow, this guy's incredible. He's so good. Yeah, his that- pitching to me this year is just different level stuff. Go ahead, James. Yeah. I was just say it almost like he's underrated in – at both hitting and pitching because it distracts yeah. from how good he is at both him being a superstar hitter. It almost like it, it, people don't appreciate how great he is as a pitcher because he's also such a great hitter. He's cut down his walk rate this year. His strikeout rate is higher. It didn't have much more to go. It didn't have, it's hard to improve on a strikeout rate that was already that good. It's even better this year. And mm-hmm. when he should be breaking down more as he's, carrying more fatigue than a normal player would he's actually getting better how is this happening yeah and, and, and he's the fastest guy going home to first baseball on average to see when i heard that stat i this is, yeah that's just not right but then i then i go i sway back and i think of aaron judge i'm thinking the guy that, that intimidated me the most albert bell was that guy he's standing on the plate i'm thinking i'm going against aaron judge and even to go going against dave winfield and think okay i i gotta i gotta throw something in and make him uncomfortable at the plate but then he would probably look up at me and go, uh, that ain't working. That ain't working. And then he hits the ball <laughs> the other way out. See, if I, whenever I face the home run hitter, Cody, you're probably the same way. If they go the other way against me and hit, hit the ball out, uh, that's not a good feeling. Because usually home run hitters hit mistakes. They pull the ball, whether they're lefty or righty. But when you're going the other way and it's flicking a ball about 450, and, and he's playing really good defense, uh, he, he's running well. I mean, I, I'm thinking, wow. I mean, it, it's it, you know what? I I get swayed every day with this whole conversation too, but I, yeah. I love the fact that the passion everybody has for it. But, you know, I, I love watching teams succeed. And, and I love what Aaron Judge, he, he bet on himself. Uh, well, that, that, that's not an easy thing to do. He bet on himself to be healthy this year. And he, he he's performing at the highest level. Shoei's the same thing. He's betting on himself going out there. If, if Phil Nevin ever gives him a day off, he's, he's really bad. He wants to play every day. He had 155 games last year, I think. He's going to have about maybe six or seven days off, and by it's not by his design. He wants to play every day. So I always appreciate guys that want to be out there every day. More Tone of the Slab in moments, but I need to tell you about our good friends at Bear Burger. Yes, Bear Burger is a burger joint, but they are not the type to be bogged down by labels. Their menus filled with options for everybody, <laughs> regardless of your preferences. So if you're even 110% vegan, or if you're craving one of their elk burgers, they're not going to judge you at all. At Bear Burger, there is only one restriction that you're going to be limited to. Food that tastes absolutely amazing. There is something for everyone at Bear Burger. You can create your own favorite burger, and <laughs> they take burgers extremely seriously with their wide variety. It is an awesome menu from top to bottom. You can build your own creation. Let them know that John Boy sent you, and then tweet it to at Bear Burger for a chance to win a bear burger gift card lunch specials run from 12 to 4 p.m monday through friday you get a choice of a select sandwich served with fries for 14.95 if you're looking for a great family night out and need some takeout dine in you can check out the family special on bearburger.com or your favorite ordering platform choose up to two cubby meals three select burgers or shakes for (laughs) 49.95 You check out their website for details. And they have one of the best happy hours in New York City going these days. The Bear Burger Kitchen and Bar Happy Hour features $1 PBRs. They have $5 mules and martinis. You get half off bottles of wine and available for seven full hours. Seven hours every Monday through Friday from noon to 7 p.m. Click the link in the description to find yourself at the best happy hour, tastiest burger joint, and overall great spot. Order.bearburger.com dot com again you can tweet it to at bear burger for a chance to win a bear burger gift card by letting them know that john boy sent you mark you touched on it i mean you see him day to day what's the coolest thing you've ever seen from shohei otani at the ballpark 
<sighs> oh, you know, b- performing or just just hanging around because it's funny because uh, maybe both. He, he's yeah, really, he's he's really a, a, a really he's got a great personality showing like he shows his emotion now when he gets a big strike out he's fist pumping and you know, you know and the other day by the way uh, Carlos Santana hits a line drive right at him because so I was well, talking you about got, how you guys have to understand he catches yeah, it the and he and apologized for catching a line drive I'd be like slamming the ball down going I got your line drive Royals, he apologized we became and like roommates, during the season the he's, he's kind of league, funny because together, if he has like an 0 for 4 he'll, he'll walk up on me and rub his arm against my arm and I need some of your luck and then I go East Coast Midwest West Coast that ran out a long time ago you don't want to waste your time on me but then he gets a hit and look up and laugh the next day so he's a funny guy he's a great one time Goofy teammates Sadie. love him we were, we were uh, but I mean I think young, everybody is at all but even Mike Trout and, uh, he sits there I had a, and we, had you know, we talk all the time and we go I don't know how you do it and I go and I, I, ended I have up coming no back explanation other than we just enjoy the unicorn and we all call him out here he's a unicorn it's just not a real came and saved me and Gooby 6'5 230 Gooby got alright what's the coolest thing that you've seen David Cohn do at the ballpark the cops are coming and so, oh Cody 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 uh, you know what I, I think the, on top the thing I love about Cody is uh, how competitive he was I mean he, 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 I always joke around with Cody he always, got to, he's a smart dude never got a chance to say thank uh, you, he's but always but got the big words which I, I can't even comprehend what he even says half the time but when he but when he's mm-hmm. when he's on the mound he was the most vicious competitor <laughs> I've ever seen and I love the fact is he never wanted to give up any any hits runs and and when when he created different arm angles against hitters, and then even the biggest of guys at the plate, I uh, sit there and you can almost hear him like make noises as he's throwing the ball at him, and then he throws that slider that starts at the hip and brings it to the inside corner. I used to love the fact to see Cody just compete so viciously on the mound. I think that would be the best way to describe it because he's you're such he's such a mild dude, but when he's on the mound, he was like the most vicious guy I've ever seen, and I love <laughs> yes. that about Cody. But now you know why I got traded. I'm throwing the full for- furniture into the pool. You wonder, hey, why did the Royals trade you? Well, I had stories like that, you know. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> hey that's really, that's the old song that's what friends are for <laughs> yeah we had so much fun i mean i love the fact that we were roommates for for all those years and uh instructional ball and then uh, you know i'll never forget the day when, when coney got traded i was so bummed that day we were in spring training he's going to be we're going to be finally together in the show you know, for the whole season. And and then, boom, he gets traded to the Mets, which, I, I, you know, probably turned out to be the greatest thing ever for him to go there with the Mets and have that success and come back and win a Cy Young with the Royals and then go back and, and, and win about 8 million World Series race. By the way, can I borrow one of those? Coney only got one. I was <laughs> lucky to get one. <laughs> We had great spin rate though on the furniture thrown in. <laughs> You're all good. <laughs> Mark, what was it like when David returned to Kansas City? Oh, that was that was amazing because you know I finally I'm like oh we finally get to play together for like the whole season. He came up the one time when I got hit in the forehead with a baseball. He took my place there. And it, it, it comes. It was actually in Anaheim. As a matter of fact, he comes up to the big leagues. But here we are together. And like I said, this be able to be finally competing with him. And as, as good friends, you're always going to be competitive. You want to do a little bit better than your friend does. And that's how I think all good rotations go as far as pitching-wise. It's everyone who wants to do a little bit better than the guy before. But having to go out there, I learned so much on how to read hitters when I when Coney came back. 
and, and see what, you know, their footwork at the plate. Did they move up? Did they move back? Did they get closer to the plate? Were they timing my pitches? And Coney was so good at throwing the timing off of hitters. I learned so much from him. And I still, to this day, whenever I, you know, get a chance to listen to Coney on the broadcast, whether it was, you know, watching the Net- Yes Network or, or ESPN Sunday Night Baseball, I still learn a lot about it because he's a student of the game. Just like we've all turned into eventually a student of the game. But, you know, you just went out early in your career with your stuff. You just competed. And then you figure it out. Things. So when Coney comes back and wins a Cy Young for us there, it was a lot of fun to see him go out there and say, and be so proud that that's my buddy going out there and doing the things he's doing. Well, Mark, David mentioned you were 6'5", 6'6", right? Like the prototypical pitcher's body that everyone would, would want to build if you were you know part of a team and, and constructing a roster here. What part of as everyone's trying to learn like you just said what part of today's pitching technology do you think that you would have benefited from the most when when you were active on the mound yeah that, that's a, that's a great question yeah, because, you know, you know you, all the you time give yourself you know, enough credit talking, you know i mean you, you know, had three the game and, years and in a row in that, pitching in specifically uh, uh, how you know, i would have loved to be able to learn to manipulate the baseball over six row more four seams because you know, i was drafted out of high school like Tony was saying he's out of Kansas City i'm out of Philly i threw a four seam fastball curveball the first day i got down to camp they said you're throwing a sinker and a slider and at that point they told me to be you know the whole you know i'm talking about workload building by the where we had our workouts we were 21 that, years so old I went on with a sinker slider guy. Pretty hard. But I would love to be able to use the four-seam fastball, run that, you have that true trajectory of your fastball you to give a different like look for a you know, hitters upstairs, up here, and then down with my sinker, throw in a curveball to throw off some back. speed. I didn't even really throw a change-up in my first four or five years in the big leagues. I learned that from Mike Magnanti, one of our left-handed pitchers. Just the grip he gave me, and what I watched him out in the outfield. So the technology today – I used to use, believe it or not, and Coney probably remembers this, a weighted baseball. I used to work it and throw. I didn't throw it as much, but I did a lot of you know simulating throwing. But I see what the guys are doing from drive line and things with the weighted baseball. Shohei does that religiously, and I would think, God, that would have been really cool to have that at my hand and and and, and be able to use that to better you know get better velocity, but also a better feel on the mound. So I was always willing to learn anything but the technology today these pitchers have and you know you don't have to be six foot five you can be five foot eleven and still get that same type of arm trajectory to be able to be successful on the mound so i love all the advancements we, we're having in baseball today <laughs> but also i still love the fact when you see guys like a garrett cole or even a Shohei otani pitch that third and fourth time through a lineup and still feel that they have no chance to play it again <laughs> Yeah, Cody, that's a great question. You know, I've, I've often sat back, you know, when you have your moments, yeah. you know, whether you're just sitting around getting ready to prepare for a game, just thinking, would have been better if I actually used my, 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 yeah. this, the, the noggin up here thinking, okay, uh, you know, there's games where you're, you're winning nine to one or nine to two and you've already that's thrown what we knew. That's, how, that's what the, the way we were conditioned and, and you just right. it's like that you're a prize well, fighter you just go out there just keep the throwing punches side, and i feel like maybe you, you go hey listen yeah, i think yeah, maybe, seven maybe run lead by the bullpen is pretty comfortable more, to hold on to that to but you just you know i i think you know that's easy to say i'm sure i told you the story my first year in the big leagues so how mccray's our dh lee may's our first base coach so, you know, we won a game, I think it was like six to three. I go six innings. And they, they used to call me Cabana Boy because I looked like Matt Dillon back in the day with Flamingo Kid movie. So they go, hey, Cabana Boy, come here. I'm like, uh, what's up, guys? They go, how'd you feel about the game? So I'm like, boy, that's a trick question. I don't know where I go. I go, good. And they go, and they, and they just started screaming at me going, you waited five days and they were dropping every bad word imaginable. And, you know, I can drop some bad words. I was like, 
wow, I never heard these words before. And they're screaming at me going, don't you ever walk on that mound and not go seven or eight innings after waiting five days to go out there while we're out there in the heat and the cold every single day of the week. You better get out there. So I'm thinking, boy, who do I want to fight? Do I want to fight Hal McRae or Lee May or do I want to fight Dick Hauser, our manager? I said, I, I take my chances with Dick Hauser. So from that point forward, I always felt my obligation was to start the game and, and shake the catcher's hand. And I, it, this was in, in my mind from that point. Was it the right thing to do? I don't think so, because I think if I would have been able to be smart enough to maybe say, okay, tap out one day, say, hey, seven innings is good. Or, or uh, maybe push me back one day. If I, I just used my mouth and said, hey, listen, I'm a little fatigued right now, but I just had that mentality that I was just going to go out there and just slug. And I, I think that, that, that probably shortened my career a little bit. But I still I, – I don't regret competing for my teammates. That's the only thing I, I don't regret about. Yeah. Benefit of hindsight, I, I feel like you do, like uh... – yeah, maybe we should have been protected a little bit more. Maybe it would have been nice to have a little more protection. But, you know, that, that's easy to say with hindsight because uh, that was a different era and they yeah. different expectations as you so well, you, you put it so well. Yeah. You know, at the same time, as we're talking about inning totals here, uh, it, it, it's kind of come back into the, the, the prism of how a lot of people look at which pitcher is most worthy for the Cy Young Award this season? And especially in the American League, you know, we're, we're, we're probably going down to the wire now for so long. Um, David and James and I, we've talked about Justin Verlander, Dylan Cease, those two big names. But there are, are some guys who are having strong finishes to this year who may have more innings than those two players. And I know you've seen a lot of the Verlanders, the Valdezes. You've seen a lot of the Astros, period. Like, what, what do you think as far as the AL Cy Young Award race goes? And as we gear toward the, the postseason, overall impressions of, of this year's version of the Astros? Yeah, I, you know what? I all along was saying I thought Verlander, because I'm a, I'm a huge fan of his. And all the times I've talked to him, he's he's like a guy that could have played in that same era with Coney and I, and because he wanted the baseball all the way through. But also you notice – there's been a couple times this year where he's had no hitters, what, in the fifth inning? I know that's coming back. But also in the seventh, and he, and he, and he didn't finish the game. Now, there was a, a year or a few years before that, there was no way you were getting that baseball out of his hands. So he realized the value of him pitching in game one of the playoffs for the Astros. I, I've said this all along. I, I think, as of this moment, Michael Brantley being out really hurts him because he's such a good hitter, and he hits lefties righties so well that I, I have no problem saying they're, they're the best team going right now and i know the dodgers are having a magical season but i, I love their pitching staff and and you know you mentioned from valdez the guy is a quality start every single game I mean, he's that good and and garcia and i mean and you know they're they're yeah. so McCullers good is back and too yeah you got lance mccullers back power on yeah, yeah. <laughs> i know they're re they're really good and, and you know jordan alvarez although he had some hand problems for a while he's starting to swing the bat well you know altuve is incredible bregman's been great jeremy pena though Keep an eye on this kid. He's really, really, really good. And he almost looks like a little younger, little thinner version of Carlos Correa. And he, he's that good of a player. So I, I kind of – and Vasquez, you guys know him a lot from obviously those years with the Red Sox. That's a that's a big pickup behind the play for them. And Martín Maldonado is a great pitch framer, does a lot of things well defensively. But having that defense and a bat with, you know, Christian Vasquez really, I think it gets them to that in the next level too. So I, I like the Astros a lot. I don't know if I value innings as much anymore as far as I used to when it comes to Cy Young in, in, in baseball. I, I, I look, well, strikeouts are, are, are you know, obviously it's a, not that it's easier to get a strikeout now, but, but strikeouts always get your attention. But I look at, you know, whips. If you have a whip below one or right at one, I mean, that, that's dealing. And, and you know, it's, it's McClanahan for the Rays is, is phenomenal too. Uh, I mean, I, I think we're in an age where, it's really fun just to see. I still say, and, I, and I'll, I'll stand by this, even though there's, you know, you have the shifts on and all this stuff, and people talk about that, pitch clocks, everything, there's better athletes now in our game than any point that I've ever seen. And, and I think we're going to enjoy this going forward because I think the game is we're trying to improve the game better where everyone can actually see it and enjoy it. That I, I'm loving where we're at in, in baseball right now.
Yeah, you know, he, oh, how about how about <laughs> Otani? Yeah, exactly. How about Otani sneaking in yeah. there? Right? Yeah. He's probably in the top three yeah. right now. I know, James, you probably have some ideas on that, too, in terms of numbers. Otani keeps going. He's making a big rush here. On the mound, he's better than, you know, Gooby described it perfectly. I mean, this guy's a monster on the mound right now. He's he's figuring things out pitching-wise, and we, we still don't know how good he's going to be on the mound. It's yeah. probably Verlander's to lose, but Otani's right there with Cease and McClanahan as well. And how much, if any, extra credit – of sorts would you give to Otani knowing that he's also carrying the responsibilities of being a, a major bat in the lineup too how do you yeah how do you have the you know you, the scouting meetings and all this that he's doing the ace of the staff thing and the carrying the lineup thing at the same time yeah I mean any and with that with the universe of the age pitchers aren't hitting anymore but he's hitting every day when he's on the mound. And I remember I was joking around one game. He went like seven innings, I think it was. And he was just bringing it. And so the eighth inning comes around in his plate appearance. And he's swinging as if he's in a long drive contest at a golf tournament. I mean, he's still <laughs> swinging so hard. I'm thinking, I would swing like that. I would fall right on the ground and I'd be gone. <laughs> Here's the one thing was I thought was incredible the other day against Seattle. He threw a sinker at 101 miles an hour to the top of the first. Bottom of the first, he hit the double off the wall that exit velocity of 107 miles per hour. I'm thinking, how's that possible? I mean, how do you throw 101 miles an hour, a sinker too, which is hilarious that he was throwing that, and then hit a, a double off the wall that hard in the same inning? I mean, it's just, it's just not human stuff. So, you know, it, it, when you talk about, you know, conversation for Sai, he's going to get over 200 strikeouts. And right now he's at 196 and 148 innings pitched. It's unreal. It's un and what he does with guys in scoring. It's funny when he goes, he kind of not, I wouldn't say casually goes through when there's no one on, but when there's a guy in scoring position, it's like next, we always next level Otani. That's when it's, he starts really bringing it. And then he starts creating these different pitches. I'm thinking only person I said, I, I knew that could do that. And I saw in person and live many times with you, Coney, creating arm angles and stuff like that and, and different deliveries. I'm like, how do you do that and still maintain balance and still throw that and still throw strikes? Because he was a guy early in his career, had a walk in his game on the mound. He doesn't have any more. He's about almost six to one strikeout to walk ratio right now, which is in, impossible when you throw that hard. Yeah, we, we know. We, we've always known he's a good hitter, but we didn't know he was going to be this good on the mound. Yeah, I mean, you, you kind of thought he could be, but I didn't realize he had that high of an aptitude that he could create that much the way you're describing it. Yeah. Mixing in that two seamer now. I mean, wow, he's a monster on the mound now. So I think he's in the top three. He's probably going to run the table yep. in the rest of his starts. So, yeah, it, it's, you know, it's Verlander, Dylan Cease, and Shohei Otani, I think, in the American League Cy Young race right now. Yeah, yeah. It is going yeah. to be such an awesome final two and a half, three weeks when you just look at these races and just how Shohei Otani is going to factor into all of them because here we are talking about him in multiple categories, right? Yeah. Insane. Mark. Thanks so much for, for taking the time here with us, talking about Otani, talking about your time in the big leagues with, with David as well. And like I said, it's, uh, you know, we, we definitely have a lot of New York fans. We love our California fans as well. So it's, uh, it's always going to be an interesting topic right through the end. We're looking forward to seeing what Otani is able to do. We're looking forward to you calling the action as well on Valley Sports West. Mark, thanks for the time here. I appreciate it. It was fun to be able to do this. By the way, last night we were flying from, Anaheim out to to Dallas here and and Mike Trout somehow magically brings a, a flat screen TV in the plane so we can watch the Eagle game last night on the plane so I'm oh, happy I still have nice. a voice because I'm screaming watch the Eagle game and I said Trouty how do you do this and I go only Trouty can do this so somehow we were able to streamline that game on the plane watching the Eagles on a flat screen TV and we're just going nuts so I'm glad I still have a voice left after screaming for the Eagles last night wow wow Good night for the Eagles. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was fun. Guys, uh, I really appreciate it. This is a good time, man. Good time. All right, Mark. Take care. Thank Thanks, you so bro. much. You got it, guys. It is time for this week in pitching history on this episode. James, what do you have for us? All right, guys. Uh, September 25th, 1965. That is 57 years ago Sunday. 59-year-old Satchel Page starts for the Kansas City A's against the Red Sox in his first big league game in 12 years. 
He pitched three shutout innings of one hit ball with the only hit being a double by Carl Yastrzemski. The A's owner, Charlie Finley, brought back the Kansas City Monarchs legend and invited other Negro League stars for a three-inning exhibition old-timers game before the A's game. So Satchel was preparing for his start. He's, he's in a rocking chair in the bullpen for the fans to see. And then after three innings, he comes out to warm up for the fourth. He gets taken out for reliever Diego Segui. Standing ovation for 59-year-old Satchel Page showing three shutout innings in the bigs. Uh, some pitchers who are 59 years old right now include Randy Johnson, David Wells, Jeff Facero, Terry, Terry Mulholland, and David Cohn. Coney, you think you could get out on a big league mound right now? There is no chance. That is just <laughs> remarkable. Great story. Great choice, James. And my hometown. I grew up uh, watching the Kansas City A's before they moved to Oakland. So I was very young. It was, it's a very distant memory. My dad tells me more about it, but they were there. The A's were in Kansas City at one point before they went to Oakland. This is a reason why when people kind of just throw it away, uh, like it's like a throwaway comment when they, when they talk about Mariano Rivera, oh, I bet he could get on the mound and get guys out right now. Uh, I don't know. I think this kind of gives Mariano some hope here. I think there's a, there's a possibility that he can definitely get some major league hitters out in this day and age. So, Mariano would be the choice, absolutely, because he's yeah. a fantastic athlete in great shape. So yeah, he would be the, he would be the guy. Guys, more toe in the slab is coming up, but the NFL action is in full swing at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NFL. We are talking touchdowns. Big plays, even bigger wins, and new customers can bet just $5 on any NFL team to win and get $200 in free bets if they do win. That's not enough. Everyone can boost their winnings with DraftKings stepped-up same-game parlays. Right now, for every leg that you add, you can boost your winnings up to 100%. With payouts bigger than ever, why bet on football anywhere else than DraftKings? To make things even sweeter, you can throw down a stepped-up same-game parlays once per game day all season long. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now to use promo code SLAB to get $200 in free bets if your team wins when you place a $5 bet on any football game. That's code SLAB, S-L-A-B, only at DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner, of the NFL minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. See show notes for details. All right, guys, three up three down here on this week's episode and I'll lead it off. Um, and I, and I, I'm, I'm pulling a mulligan here. I've I, last minute decision to, to switch it up. I think before the episode, I was really leaning heavily just to kind of highlight Max Scherzer, Justin Verlander, both returning and being flawless at the top of their respective team's rotation as both the Mets and the Astros have clinched playoff berths already. They're ready to go. But I I want to give some love to another guy we've talked about over the course of the season, but Framber Valdez and his 25 uh, quality starts here. He recorded a major league record 25th quality start over the weekend against the Astros. If you think about Valdez, Following Justin Verlander in the Astros playoff rotation, I mean, that is as good as it's going to get, especially in the American League. But uh, Framber Valdez has a, a great ERA. He's at the top of the innings chart in the American League. And it, the the record just personifies him. It's, it has the perfect word labeled to Framber Valdez, quality, all season long. So Framber Valdez, I, I was forced to change my pick here, guys. Good choice. I like it. I like last minute changes like that. That's good. It's fresh. It's good. It shows some guts. I like it. All right, James, who do you have? Uh, Giving some love to Spencer Strider, another double digit strikeout game. Uh, Put him over 200 Ks for the season in only 131 and two thirds innings. This is a guy who wasn't even in the starting rotation until May 30th. And he's had a great year. And I got I I noticed this when I was, uh, researching Nestor Cortez's upcoming start and saw that he is not on any of the inning qualifying leaderboards because in order to show up on an ERA list, you have to have pitched one inning per team game. And so he's not on the list in the AL. Spencer Strider would be eighth in the National League if we set a cutoff of 120 innings or more, but it's like his season doesn't exist now. He's at 2.67 ERA in 131 innings. And I think 
we need to change the bar for qualifying on ERA lists and, and, and rate stat leaderboards because now there are only not even two pitchers per team on these lists. So there's 48 qualifiers in Major League Baseball in a 30-team league. That's It's almost meaningless to have a list where you're filtering out so many pitchers. If we lower the bar from throwing 162 innings in a season to say 130, we would have like 50 pitchers in the AL and 50 pitchers in the NL. And it would be more like, you know, three pitchers per team, giving us a good idea who were the starting pitchers, who are the regular pitchers in this given season. And we can kind of have something resembling the historical standard that we've had before. Could not agree more. Uh, James, we talked about this before and you, you brought it up to me actually originally. And it, it's, it's a very uh, interesting point, dead on. Um, and you're right. We just want to know what the landscape is. Show us, show us who, who pitched, show us who's doing what. It's a, different, it's a different environment nowadays. It's a different criteria for starting pitchers. So that is not reflected in, in uh, exactly what James is talking about. So, so we're, miss, we're missing some, some pitchers. And actually, we might have some pitcher, We might have some guys that are going to get a lot of Cy Young consideration that won't meet that qualifier. You got a guy throwing 150 or so innings that might have, you know, uh, some of the best numbers in the league that, that are going to get some Cy Young votes. So that, that's the point. Yeah. You know, that, that needs to be adjusted. I could not agree more. Um, I'm going to go out West. You know, I, I think everybody, you know, the Seattle Mariners are not getting enough credit. I don't think they're a team anybody wants to face right now because of their pitching. They beat the Yankees by getting Luis Castillo at the trade deadline. But if you look at their rotation, Logan Gilbert's had a fantastic year. I and mean, the Yankees have seen him. He's dominated the Yankees when we've seen him out in Seattle. 98 miles an hour, good slider, big, long, great extension. Looks like he hands the ball to the catcher with his long, lopey, you know, uh, extending motion. Uh, he had 11 punch outs yesterday against the Angels in his last seven, seven starts. He's 3-1 with a 2.01 ERA. He's a monster on the mound. If you look at Seattle with him, Robbie Ray, and Luis Castillo in the first three starters, and then also George Kirby, young pitchers, have a great year. That is not a rotation that you want to face in a short series. So watch out for the Mariners, and much love going Logan Gilbert's way, one of the great young pitchers in our game right now. I am going to be bold here and go out on a limb and say that of the teams that are going to have to be playing a best-of-three series – I think the Mariners could be the most dangerous team. I don't think you would want to face them in a best of three series between the, the rotation that you just mentioned, but the, the bullpen arms that they have factor in J rod. That's a scary team. And then going up there, that's a real home field advantage for them as well. Agreed. Definitely. That, those, that pitching can dominate you. They can shut down any offense and anywhere. So yes, you watch out for the Mariners. Mm -hmm. They're hungry too. The whole fan base is hungry. It's been a long time since they've sniffed postseason. And those fans up there are for real. Speaking from personal experience, they're wild, they're loud, and they're hungry. So watch out for Seattle right now. All right, guys, that's going to do it for this episode here. Big thank you to Mark Ubazov for stopping by. A reminder, new episodes of the show, they drop every single week. Please rate, review, subscribe. It's the best way that you can show your support for the show. So for David, for James, for myself, and... For our excellent producer, Dan Work, we will talk to you next week here on Tone of the Slab, Pitching with David Cohn, a production of John Boy Media. Take care, everybody.